Brent Musburger was honored uh, a couple of nights ago, and uh, he got the Lifetime Achievement Sports Emmy and told some great stories. Uh, he's the uh, lead voice, uh, play-by-play announcer, uh, Vegas Stats and Information Network on Sirius XM. Brent, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Dan. I am, uh, I am great. What was the poll question? What, what, was the, uh, what was the question you guys threw out today? McLovin? What were you asking him? Was Derek Jeter overrated, correctly rated, or underrated? Everybody said correctly rated. Well, that was the majority. Is that what yeah. it came? Yeah. yeah. Majority. You you would go with the majority. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was wondering about um, you weren't emotional when you got this lifetime achievement award. You were having fun telling stories. Were you surprised that uh, like you weren't emotional? You know, I never expected to be emotional. Um, you know, looks at him. Uh, I travel. Hold on a second, Brent. We're going to get a better phone line there. Yeah. You want to take a break and then we'll come back. We'll see if we can get Brent on a better line. For sure. All right, we'll do that. You weren't emotional. You were just telling stories. That's where we left off. How come you weren't emotional and kind of reminiscing there? You know, Dan, I never expected to be emotional because uh, I've had uh, such a great journey. And uh, you can't beat fun at the old ballpark, my friend. Um, you know, this is uh, there's a lot of things in this world that are a lot more serious than uh, going to sporting events. And, um, I listen, I've enjoyed my life every minute of it. Came away with great memories, great friendships. And um no, I never I never thought it was gonna be emotional to tell you the truth. You did tell uh, some fun stories though. Now, can we tell the story about the, the steam room in uh, the sauna in <laughs> in Europe when you you showed up naked? <laughs> it, I've gotta tell you something. I, I should have told the uh the end game on it too, because um as you know, I had Drew Esikoff, uh, the, the, the Emmy Award-winning director of Sunday Night Football, who had worked a lot of football with me back in the day when I came over to ABC. And so he and I were doing uh, <laughs> the World League of American Football in places like Barcelona and Frankfurt. And we were at a hotel in Frankfurt, Germany, and we were at poolside. Uh, it was mid-morning. We had a game that night. And... Um, and he said to me, Drew said to me, you know, I think I'm going to go down and uh, take a sauna. And I said, I, ah, gee, I wish I could do that, but I don't, I don't have my swimming suit with me. And he said, Brent, Brent, this is Europe. This is Europe, my friend. Nobody wears a swimsuit inside a sauna. I said, okay, I'll see you then. I'll, down, I'll finish this cup of coffee. I'll be down. So Drew uh, proceeded to go down stairs and, put on his swimsuit, as he told the crowd the other night. And, of course, I went walking down, and there were hangers there to put your clothes, and so I got undressed, went over to the sauna, opened the door, and uh, uh, there must have been four or five people in there, uh, men and women, and they were all fully clad in their (laughs) swimsuits. And, of course, I was totally naked as I opened the door, and I said, oh, my God. I couldn't wait. I wanted to choke him right there. So I moved over to the corner of the sauna as quickly as I could. Wait, wait, you stayed in there naked? Oh, yeah. (laughs) What if you, Brent, what if you would have said, you are looking live? (laughs) That would have been the best thing to say, but I was so mad at him. I wanted to just go, and he's up there with that Cheshire (laughs) grin on his face, okay? Just up on the top row. Now, the kicker is, I knew I was going to sit there and wait till everybody got out, <laughs> and then I would leave. Okay, so everybody left except, except this one young Asian woman who had the constitution of a marathon runner and who was stretched out and just enjoying this. I am sweating; it is pouring off me. All I'm going to do, but I do not want to get up and walk out of the out of the sun. She finally gets up, finally leaves. I hear the shower outside on, and I hear it turned off. I finally leave, get a shower, get the. I can't wait to find him. I I, I just wanted to. I wanted to drown him, drown him someplace. It was, it's, uh, I, and then to kick it all off, I was later in. Uh, 
some small town. It wasn't I wasn't covering a football game. I was meeting some people, and uh, we were at a spa, big big pool area in Germany, and um, and uh, the sauna was upstairs. And I said to my friend, uh, who, who I didn't work, I said, "Come on." I said, come on, everybody wears swimming suits when you go inside the sauna. So now we walked into the European sauna, and everybody was nude except us. <laughs> we so I haven't been able to get the European You can't get sauna, it right. But you no, can't. I just can't get it right. Um, you also <laughs> told a story when Doug Flutie throws that touchdown pass that helped him win a Heisman. You were doing the broadcast, and uh, Gerard Phelan catches uh, the touchdown pass to win it against Miami. Jimmy Johnson's the head coach of the Hurricanes. But the aspect I didn't know about this is the defensive coordinator for Miami didn't see that last play because he's coming down the <laughs> elevator at, to beat the right. crowd. So he's not even there to be the defensive coordinator for that final play exactly. that helped Boston College win. Yeah, exactly. The, you know, um, after uh, – Miami went in for the go-ahead touchdown inside of a minute to play. He obviously thought that the game was over. And uh, there one elevator coming down from the old Orange Bowl, and it used to be a rush to get there. Uh, these days, there's pretty much an attendant there because the assistant coach is down. But he wanted to get out. And so when Boston College got a decent return and put Flutie close to midfield, and they lined up for what would look, turn out to be the um, the winning touchdown. There was a false start, and uh, the Miami defense had come to the line of scrimmage on that false start. They were playing press coverage, and when uh, the penalty was made, Jimmy wanted to get a hold of the defensive coordinator and clarify exactly what coverage they wanted to call, or did he want to substitute an extra wide receiver or another defensive back into the secondary. And he couldn't get a hold of him because he was in the uh, he was in the elevator, as it turned out. I, you know, needless to say, he was he became the ex defensive coordinator before the start <laughs> of next season. So he wasn't there when uh, when Doug hurled the winning touchdown pass down into the end zone. And and what's what's kind of interesting about Gerard Phelan at the other end of it is I didn't have making the call. I didn't have any idea who had caught it. There were just so many bobbies down in the end zone. They tumbled down in a pile down there. I just knew it was somebody with Boston College jersey on. But Kevin O'Malley, uh, one of our executives at CBS, was in the truck, and he reached over the producer's uh, shoulder, pulled the key back, and said, Brian, it's Phelan, Gerard Phelan, to which I, I never doubted it when I heard Kevin's voice. I, I knew he knew because he'd gone to BC, and so I called it right away. And then Doug and I... Oh, I don't know, three, four years ago, we did a piece for Thanksgiving for ESPN for Sports Center about it. And I related that little story, and Doug started to laugh. And he said, You know, Brent, I didn't know who caught it either. He said, I'm going up the tunnel, uh, up to the locker room, and I say to my center, Who caught the pass? And the guy looks at me and says, Hey, Doug, it's your roommate. Gerard Phelan caught it. So and it he, was, you know. And he it, just it, won the Heisman. That helped him win the yeah, Heisman. Yeah. Right. It did. And you know what's interesting that is that if you go back, and it doesn't make any difference what game it is, if you go back about 10 years or so and talk to the participants, you're going to find little stories like that. Yeah. You will not find them immediately after the game. That's not going to happen. First of all, uh, there's the emotion of the moment. And second of all, people are just aren't going to tell you everything that went on. Jimmy was not going to tell the media afterwards that SOB was in the elevator <laughs> and I couldn't get a hold of him. You know, he's going to say, listen, we should have knocked the ball down. Uh, congratulations to Doug Flutie and blah, 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 blah. They're going to move on. But if you go back, if you go back about a decade later, and that's why I love to sit around and uh, listen to uh, athletes tell stories of days gone by. I, it's just wonderful, wonderful memories. And I think really I, that's what I take away from is all the, all the great memories and, and events and moments and and. And the teamwork that goes into it. I mean, when you're doing radio, uh, like basically is what we're doing at VSIN right now until next fall when the streaming gets up and gets going pretty good at VSIN on the uh, Sirius XM, uh, it's entirely it's entirely different. You're you're pretty much dependent on yourself. But when you get into a television uh, broadcast, you've got so many people you're dependent upon, and I've had such great help through the years. Um, Drew Essex, I'm just one of 
many Hall of Fame directors that I've, that I've had the chance to work with. So I, listen, I come away with nothing but fondness and, uh, and, and great feelings for everybody in the industry and all the networks and the great shows that are put up. Uh, you know, I've said many a time that I love what you guys do on Sunday night uh, before the Sunday night game in the studio. I love the show. And the other day, NBC at the uh, Kentucky Derby, of course, we're all over it because that's, you know, one of the most bet, well, it's the most bet horse race out here in Las Vegas. And, and I just love what the networks do. And last night I watched two game sevens when I got home. And uh, Pittsburgh, the Penguins, moved on to the Eastern Conference National Hockey League playoffs. And then uh, Anaheim, trailing one nothing, came back and, and won with a couple of goals. And uh, I was thoroughly entertained. I mean, it, the sports business on television is just wonderful, and uh, that's the, really that's what I take away from it. It wasn't it wasn't about me crying about being up there for fifty years. Okay, so be it. Time passed quickly. I want to ask you in the final two minutes: uh, How does the NFL embrace betting? You know, it's it's uh, that is such a good question. You know, they have denied it for a long, long time. I don't know if I've told you about the day when when Jimmy the Greek and I. When we put, first put the Greek on the NFL today, uh, we went over to Pete Rozelle's office, and we had a meeting. And I knew that Pete had embraced gambling at the horse racing level because I'd seen him at the racetrack several times. So he understood what was going on. And he just kind of asked us not to put minus 3, plus 10, whatever, the, the numbers up there, which we agreed to. And that's what led to the, uh, the checkboard that the Greek and I used on the old days. But the truth of the matter is, and Pete knew it, that the National Football League would not be as big as it is today without people enjoying wagering. And it doesn't have to always be point spread gambling. You could you can play in pools where you just pick winners uh, every week, and millions of people do in this country. You, you take a chance, but you love to have a team whether it's $20,000 or just $20, you like to take a position. Now, the big change, Dan, and I was not sure that they would do this. I knew the Raiders wanted to come to Las Vegas. But when the league announces that the Raiders are coming to Las Vegas, uh, it's game, set, and match, okay? There, there is no way now that they can say that uh, we do not accept it now. Whether or not it ever becomes a standard operating procedure for people other than Al Michaels uh, to, <laughs> to say what over 100 numbers are and spread numbers, I'm not sure that they're quite there yet. Um, and listen, it's not the most important thing. It never will be the most important thing. But there's a lot of I money think. there, and the NFL is yeah, in the absolutely. money-making business. Yeah, absolutely. And you know when you go to Europe, when you go to Europe, and you go inside the big soccer stadium, many of them yeah. have sponsorship agreements with Ladbrokes and uh, you know William Hill and all the great bookmakers around the world. So it is going to eventually, and it will be in places in the United States beyond the borders of Nevada. That's coming too, okay? And the National Hockey League is coming in here. Uh, the NBA commissioner has talked about it. And we're talking billions of dollars bet every year. And much of it is bet offshore illegally uh, with the Internet. Internet and the digital world changed everything also. So people can bet anywhere, anytime. And it's time to have a regulated market uh, for the people to keep an eye on it, see what's going on, and keep the money onshore in the United States. There's no, there's no reason for it. I'd like to uh, I'd like to dive into this uh, when we have more time. Just this topic itself, I have some uh, ideas Absolutely. on it. But um, it was great, great to see you the other night, and uh, I yeah, hope to too. talk to you about this soon. You. you got it. Thanks, Dan. Thanks I, a lot. Hi, right, buddy. Guys. That's uh, Brent Musburger. Yeah, he told some great stories. Going in the sauna. You are looking live at me naked. And he didn't leave. No, the fact that he didn't leave. That's the great part of it. The Dan Patrick Show, weekday mornings on Audience.